Um, yeah, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, we're just based two miles up the road. So this is enormously convenient. This is the first time I've been to this um, and really happy I came. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about, first about Las Cumbres Observatory. Um, we are a global robotic telescope network. We have 25 telescopes at seven different sites around the world. Um, and it was founded by um, somebody who is an inveterate engineer and happened to make a lot of money doing engineering. And he's also an amateur astronomer and he wanted to build a network like this and the internet and everything else caught up um, started in 2005 and has been fully operating since uh, 2014. So that's the map. It is a unique observatory. There's not, there's lots and lots of different telescopes around the world. There are robotic telescopes, telescopes operated classically. Um, but ours is unique for a couple of different things. It is fully robotic. We are almost all based here in Goleta. Um, but the telescopes run themselves pretty much. They're all based at established observatory sites. So if we do need some help, we contact the site support people there and ask them to go do that. They operate, they're not space instruments. They do not operate completely unattended. So we have people do that. Um, but they know we have weather stations. They know when it's light, when it's dark, when the, the weather's turning bad, those types of things. But what's truly unique about it is they are dynamically scheduled. Our software team is actually the biggest team at the observatory um, because software runs this. Um, the scheduler treats the entire network as basically kind of a single instrument. Um, and every five minutes, it can reschedule observations based on changing conditions. Um, at an observatory, it started to rain, had to close the dome. Okay, there's an important observation that has to happen tonight. We'll move it to the next site that's available. Um, and it takes a while to actually, it took me a while. I've only been at the observatory for almost three years, but to really truly understand um, how amazing that process is. This picture effectively explains the whole thing. Um, what this is, is we talked earlier a little bit about gravitational waves. This is the kilonova from 2017, the two neutron stars that merged, and it created an optical counterpart. Anybody with access to a telescope pointed in the direction of where they thought this was to try and um, locate, identify the optical counterpart. Within 45 minutes, six teams had done that. LCO was one of those teams. But LCO was the only observatory that could just then continue to follow this object. And so what this shows is brightness on the left and the days since the merger on the, on the um, x-axis. And, and what you can see up at the top, those little globes, it's telling you where the observations were taken. So the first one's Chile, Australia, South Africa. That repeats again two more times then the weather was bad, and the last one is in Chile. <laughs> so we were really unfortunate that the weather in the southern hemisphere was good for those four days, because we were able to catch the, that it brightened in the first day, and then got dimmer by a factor of 20. This is the power of this observatory and effectively what it was designed for. It was a fabulous, even though these didn't exist, we, didn't, we hadn't ever detected one of these when it was uh, designed. So, our mission is pretty simple. Um, advance our understanding of the universe through science and education. Um, the substantial majority of the time on the observatory is used by scientists for a diverse range of science programs. But education is, a, it's not an add-on, it's a real part of our mission. And again, our, our goals are simple. Not simple. They're not simple to do. They're simple to describe. You know, we want to inspire people. Primarily, it's our programs are primarily aimed at high school age and below. Um, support innovative programs because we don't know everything about what you should do. 
we actually know really know well know how to run an observatory, but um, but we don't know everything about how to inspire young people, inspire students. Um, and we want to reach a global audience. We're a global observatory. We want to try and, and connect with um, uh, people in the countries where we are and around the world where we're not necessarily there. So in 2017, we founded a program called the Global Sky Partners. And right now we have 30 partner organizations. They run their own program that they proposed and designed. And we provide them telescope time and support. Um, in other words, we do the things we're good at. We're really good at running an observatory. Um, the educators, like yourselves, are really good at doing what they do. And it's turned out to be just a really, um, oh, that didn't work. Oh, well, what that says, it says, um, fonts. Um, what it says, we provide telescope time, um, educational resources, tech support, because a lot of these people have no idea how to take observations, but we can teach them how to do that. I think the main thing we provide is a community. It's one of my favorite meetings of the month. I try and call in for the partners forum and listen to all these people talk to each other. So the more experienced partners can help the newer ones. They have formed new collaborations. Um, and it's just, it's, it's, it's the one meeting a month where I can just listen and say, God, we're doing something right here. This is good. <laughs> this is awesome. Um, that's lovely colors, don't you think? Um, what it, what it, it's a diverse color plot. And the point of this slide was we support a diverse group of programs. We've got student um, research, kind of straight up student research programs. We've got um, citizen science programs. We do teacher training, you know, all these types of things. Um, again, it's the partners put together the program they want to do, and then we support it. Um, I'll just highlight a few of them. Um, one of them is called Astrolab. Um, and it is primarily based um, with countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. And it is actually aimed at college undergraduates. Uh, it's the only program we currently have that's aimed at college undergraduates. So I have a proposal into the NSF to try and create a version of that for the US. Um, but it's, we, these are institutions that have no astronomy department. They don't necessarily have an astronomer on staff, but it's a, a week or two workshop. The focus is on transferable skills. They're taking science observations, they're reducing them, they're communicating and writing it down, this kind of stuff. And then they work with a mentor for the rest of the year um, uh, on their projects. The last time they were able to do it in person was 2019. So we're hoping that can maybe start up again this year. Um, Our Solar Siblings is a group based in Australia. They do uh, teacher training and student workshops. Um, there are several, they have a, an online um, course they've developed. And there are several programs like that in the, in the US that we also support too. Um, Voice Astro is in San Diego, um, Stanford Online High School, and the INSTAR Institute up in uh, Sonoma. Uh, for something completely different, there's one called Where's the Flux? I don't know if any of you remember it was either in 2016 something, somebody wrote an article about this unusual star that had this unusual variation. It's not one anybody could you know, explain. And oh, it's alien megastructures. No, it's not, but anyway. But engaged a huge amount of people. Um, it's called, commonly known as Tabby's star. Tabitha Boyajan is the um, astrophysicist at LSU who runs this. Um, uh, and she runs uh, a citizen science program. All the discussion, data reduction, and what they're going to do is done in a Reddit, a subreddit discussion group. Um, and that's been going now for a few years. Um, and another one that's, that's very unique was called Appalachian Star Song, which was um, a collaboration between a, a North Carolina high school um, and 
the library system um, in their area. And what they did is they learned about the science of variable data observations of variable stars, learned how to take the observations, reduce them, and plot them. And so they made light curves, which is what you do with variable star. And what this is on the um, uh, y-axis is the magnitude. So an astronomer should everything backwards, so it's bright at the top with the um, smaller numbers and thinner at the bottom. Um, and then time on the, the x-axis. Um, and what they did is they, this is one of the kids' notebooks, um, and they plotted the variable stars, and then they had, um, they sonified it. They had a local musician um, play these on a dulcimer <laughs> and recorded them. So I thought that was incredibly clever um, um, in terms of engagement. Um, we have, as I said, traditional programs that have, um, the kids are just doing their own research. Um, we have, uh, this is, I think, the 2020 numbers. Uh, we had, you know, 21 papers in peer-reviewed journals, one of them in a professional astronomy journal. Um, and that's kind of an ongoing theme each year. Some of the programs do that. Many of these programs target multiple areas. They have student workshops, teacher training, um, and, and other things. I'll give you a, just a, um, an overview of where we are and where we're trying to go. Um, we're cur the current group is, will be our 2021 class. It's 2021, 2022. But for the, the, the three previous cohorts, um, where our partners have audiences, where they're focused, where they have students, and where they're engaged. And we had a, you know, a lot of places. And in 2018, we've moved into Caribbean, South and Southern, South America, Latin America, um, and Asia. And in fact, in 20, the 2021 class, this is going to get much larger. Um, we have in Brazil, they have a thousand teachers. I ended up not selecting this program as part of the main um, cohort because we typically offer 1,300 hours of telescope time for the whole thing, and they wanted 500. But as a director, I can provide director's discretionary time. So we did. We carved out that chunk for them because it's it's great if it works. <laughs> and 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 we have our educational network is the 0.4 meter telescopes, the smallest aperture, but we have 10 of them. We have plenty of telescope time. We don't oversubscribe them because in particular we want our education audiences to be successful. If something goes wrong, just do it again. Scientists can whine if they don't get it, but they can wait a little longer and, and, and get their observations. And so our map of showing where our audiences are, you can't see it here, everything looks blue. Anyway, we have, um, we have audiences on every continent except Antarctica, and they're growing uh, in outside. Of course, there's a lot in the US, but they're growing outside of that. Um, the part about this that really excites me personally, and this is tied into some of the things we've already talked about today, is what's the impact of this? This is a completely non-homogenous group of people to survey. So what we do is we ask each of the partners, at the end of their program, survey your audience, and ask them about agreement with effectively three statements, which are these. And these are the numbers that we are getting. And many of these people, this is their first, first um, experience with anything scientific. This directly relates to our, our very recent conversation. I didn't discover physics until I already had a bachelor's degree in business administration. <laughs> And I'm sure I would have been kick-ass at business administration, but, but I'm an observatory director. It worked out well in the end anyway. Um, but, but I thought I wanted to do computer science, but I hadn't taken enough science courses. I'd never taken a high school physics course. And so I took Mechanics 101, and my thought, you know, the giant 500-person lecture hall, and it was like, how come nobody told me? 
<laughs> I was just completely captivated by this whole physics thing. <laughs> but what I want to do is I, I thought about what if I had gotten somebody got to me earlier? And that's what I really would like to do with this program. Have kids of whatever age think of themselves as a scientist. And I think that might help, you know, some of these things in terms of, as opposed to writing it off, that's not me. So we also provide um, some educational resources along with, um, you know, just talking to people. We have an online textbook called Spacebook. Parallax is our most popular page. Um, and we were stunned in reading the formal citation for the 2019 Nobel Prize. They used our figure from Facebook on the Doppler shift in the citation for the Nobel Prize for the discovery of exoplanets with radio velocities. That was awesome. Um, we had nothing to do with the Nobel Prize, but we liked that they used our figure. Um, we also have um, other things we built. We have a robot called Serral, um, and you can go on adventures with Serral. This covers, this can start at earlier ages than you know the high school, middle school crowd, but also potentially there. And on your missions, you can take a picture with a telescope and we'll mail it to you. So, and it does other things. Um, so that is an introduction to Global Sky Partners. And if you are interested in more information about the program, you can certainly talk to me or Edward Gomez is actually the brains behind all of this. He's based in Wales, but he's available um, via email <laughs> um, all the time. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Questions? No questions? Yeah, Maggie. Can read here? Yeah, okay. Can you tell us just a little bit about what writing a proposal is like? Oh, for the Global Sky Partners? Yeah. Um, it is not like writing um, um, a, a major government NASA NSF proposal. It's much simpler than that. Um, and in fact, what if somebody is interested in, has an idea and they're not sure it fits, we started a new program this year called Pilot Partners. I got this idea. I don't know if this will really work. So we'll give you some telescope time to try it out. So then you can apply to be a full partner in the next call. It is not heavily oversubscribed. Um, we have an external um, peer review committee review the proposals for us. Um, and they will make, it's, and again, if it's not super great, we might try and help you make it better so that it'll fit. So it's, it is not a, um, uh, here's the line and everybody below it doesn't get anywhere. So I would, if anybody's interested, the thing to do would be to chat with Edward in advance. Our next proposal call will be coming out sometime in the next couple of months because we start each class in August. Um, it runs from August through July. I guess this is kind of a general question because as a physics teacher, are your online resources free? Yes. Yes. Yes, um, all of this is free. That's fantastic. Um, yeah. And then my other question is, is if I wanted to get my students involved, because we obviously do a unit on stars and nuclear reactions, um, how could I get them involved without traveling all the way up to Santa Barbara? You don't have to travel anywhere. We so don't. How we, would I, like, all of this is done online. Everything. Ooh, I guess that was my question. Yeah. Yeah. No, we don't. We, we, we are based here, mm -hmm. but... All of the all of the interactions with the Sky Partners are all remote because they're spread all over the place. The Global Sky Partners. Now, like, are there like sample lesson plans that you have that we could use, or do we just um, develop like based on the technology that you have and online resources? Do we just see how we can incorporate it into? What our you can do is see what there is for the the, the online resources, mm -hmm. and if you're interested in sample lesson plans, this would be 
call Edward. Okay. We'll find one of the other partners that has that and they can point you to that information. People are really good about sharing whatever they've put together because yeah, this is, this is all, um, most everything we have is, is kind of, we, we're a very open source kind of shop, you know, create it and send it out there. Thank you. I, I thought this is very cool. I teach at Natick High School in Natick, Mass. And our school has an astronomy club. Mm -hmm. So would this be something that the, because it's remote uh, and the astronomy club, can they get time? And I have to, I have to share it with the astronomy club advisor, but can they schedule a set of activities and time to observe? It's, it's you, you don't, it's, you could potentially put together a program for an astronomy club. Um, yes, it's not, but it's not that you, you don't sign, I want to just want to be clear, you don't sign up for time on, you know, Wednesday evening. You sign up for time for observations of targets, which will be taken when the targets are visible. But yes, if you wanted to put together um, a program for um, a club, potentially, that again, I would, would, I would, what I would do is I would talk to Edward about what you're thinking. And he can tell you whether or not that, you know, how that would fit. Because it's wrapping your head around, it's not, you know, most of the observations, you, you don't schedule time at night with the club. But if there's a, a program you want to do a particular science project or educational science project with telescope time that the club wanted to do, then that might be um, um, something that would work. Thank you. I guess I have a pair of, of related questions. Uh, one is just sort of, I'm interested in a survey of what kind of science projects high school students are doing with these telescopes. Are we talking like variable starlight curves or? We do variable starlight curves. There are now a number of these groups doing exoplanet transits. Neat. Um, um, that's kind of, you know, step two, start with, start with uh, variable starlight curves. Because you can just, you're going to have success. The variable starlight curves you know, got that nailed down. Students will have success with their first science program. Um, and then you can go on from there. I think there's now five of the partners have gotten together and have an exoplanet little coordinated consortium they're doing for doing exoplanet transits. And related, is there room for proposals that are entirely or mostly student initiated? Because I'll usually have a handful of students who are really into astronomy, but not necessarily a whole class or the, the time or freedom to structure, you know, a sizable chunk of a physics class around a, an astronomy unit. I'll have three nerds who are really into stars, and yeah. they might be really excited about this kind of opportunity. Um, I would think we would want to have a grown up as the name on it, but I got no problem with the people who are actually going to do the work being the people who write the proposal and do it. Yeah, I'm a big fan of students being able to, um, yeah, they want to. In fact, it's really funny. One of the programs we had with um, variable stars. Um, I started getting director's discretionary time proposals. I'm thinking, what, what is this? <laughs> and finally reached out to them and it was, they had gotten just really excited about this and they hadn't told the, the, the um, teacher who was working with them. And because I thought, this is really odd. So I told them, I said, this is not really quite what this is for, but if you really have something specific, you know, reach out to me and I'll try and sort it out. But they took the initiative to submit director's time proposals to me directly, which um, we worked it out and gave them some time and it was fine, but yeah. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Let's thank Lisa one last time.